This is Stephanie Lemelin, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Joe Moniak, D, 0, 5. Hello team, welcome back and thanks for joining us for episode 2 of Whelmed Season 4. My name is Rich and with me is my co-host Emily and producer Neil. Hey everyone, in these review episodes we'll be diving into the plots, characters, easter eggs, comic book history, and everything else of Young Justice, and use that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, but we'll be discussing them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. And with all that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The title of this week's episode is Needful. The release date was October 16th, 2021. The in-episode date was March 23rd. The writer was Andrew Blanchett. The director was Vinton Hoyk. And the voice director was, as always, Jamie Thompson. Special guest voice credits include Dee Bradley Baker as Desaad and Reap Daggle. Troy Baker as Russ Etta. Ben Diskin as Makam Moores. Zara Fuzzle as Jarlia Jax and S- Soraya Smith. Ah, that works. I'm leaving it. Phil Hamar as Jam Jax. Carl Lumley as Maat Moores. Kari Walgren as Jan Moores. Tinya Wazo and Imra Arden. Hendon Walsh as Imri Jaans and Perdita Vladek. Just in time for your next mission. This week's episode picks up right where last week's left off in the chaotic aftermath of the Zeta tube to Earth exploding. No one can get through to the Watchtower, no one knows if John is alive or dead, and Emery's readings clearly indicate that the Zeta Tube was intentionally sabotaged. After the credits, Makam is arrested for the explosion, despite McGann insisting that there's no way he could have done it. She and her parents then head off to see if there's anything they can do to help him, leaving Connor and Garfield behind to work out the Zeta Tube mystery. While news of the explosion is already spread across the planet, sowing further unrest and distress, Emery is eventually able to get in contact with the Watchtower, revealing that Martian Manhunter is indeed alive. But before a cyborg can lock onto her signal and open a boom tube, the Mars-Earth communication satellite also explodes, leaving our heroes without backup. Meanwhile, Phantom Girl, Chameleon Boy, and Saturn Girl watch from a distance and make cryptic comments about who could have done this and why. Elsewhere, the Moors family attempts to reason with Makam, but it just leads to a confrontation between him and McGann about all of his rage over the caste system on Mars and their parents' failures, as well as how she abandoned him when she left for Earth. And back at the Zeta Tube wreckage, Prince Jim asks if his father's murder could be connected to the Zeta Tube's destruction and asks Beast Boy and Superboy to look into the case. Meanwhile, McGann tries to convince Makam to reveal why he is actually lurking at the lab site to prove his innocence, but he refuses, insisting that he couldn't have done it and they don't have the evidence to prove that he did. Later at the Sacred River, Connor and McGann meet sorceress priestess Ciara Samit, who officiates their Ma'ayava'ana ceremony, with the wedding set to take place in three days' time. Back at the royal court, Jem's decision to involve our heroes in the solving of King Saturn's murder has caused even more conflict, as Rez Edda doesn't trust the Earthlings to prove his racist theory about the murderer, while the Queen believes that they'll have more experience in this kind of crime solving. And back at the Sacred River, McGann and Connor, being adorable and heading off to check in with Bioship, is interrupted by an unexpected cave-in. In the aftermath of the latest dilemma, it's revealed that Connor can in fact be injured on Mars due to the decreased oxygen and the lack of sunlight underground. Yeah, I'm sure that'll be fine. (laughs) And that (laughs) during... Totally, it'll be fine. It's fine. They never foreshadow stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And that during the commotion, Miss Martian picked up on the unknown psychic signature of those alien strangers that we've seen lurking around in the background. And we then see that their group is worried someone was trying to reveal their presence and that they won't be able to do their job, quote unquote, now that they have to keep a further distance from our heroes. 
And down in Makam's hideout, Dasad arrives via Boom Tube to deliver Makam's reward for his work on New Genesis last season. A gene bomb that, when it explodes, will release a virus that kills all non Aashin Martians on the planet. And over the credits, we see Garfield scrolling through his phone while the voicemail from Queen Perdita plays, revealing that there's a refugee crisis happening as people flee Markovia for Vladova as King Brion welcomes more and more metahumans into his country. Superboy, are you alright? I'm fine. Feeling the Aster. And with that... Aster! (laughs) (laughs) Who wants to start? So... When these episodes originally came out, I did a lot more of like research into the Legion just because that had that there's a lot there and they had just never gotten onto my own radar. Um, and to say that there are a lot of Legionnaires is just a gr- <laughs> as a gross understatement, um, a ridiculous understatement. And that comes from like watching the J like the just JLA cartoons where they're just like, you know, we should just add everyone. That way, if we have a problem, we have a specific solution in so and so. And I felt like it's very much the same. So my my thought is like when they all showed up, now we've got like full costumes. Like what was your first reaction, Rich, was seeing the costumes? Because obviously it I guess in theory it can't look like some of the earlier costumes, it's like I don't think that would just translate all that well. Yeah, Saturn Girl's original costume probably wouldn't fly yeah. <laughs> these days. I think I talked I may have touched on this a little bit in Crashing the Mode last time. I can't remember, but that just the the uh designs for them are are beautiful. I mean, the original characters were basically just human. There it was like it was the era of Star Trek, right? It's like, oh, this alien is a humanoid with a more different nose. Right. Or uh, ears are slightly lower. You know, they're just humanoids. They're just humans. Otherwise, it was kind of like that. So Chameleon Boy was originally just a teenage human boy who's bald with antenna and pointy ears and orange skin. Otherwise, just looks like a guy. Right. The same thing with with Phantom Girl. Tina was was just just a just a teenage girl. Right. They were trying to, of course, you know, I mean, the whole the whole Legion theme was aimed directly at teenagers and I'll point out was written by a teenager. It was aimed at that group. So it was just, you know, they kept it. They kept it kind of pretty consistent. Now, when they did a, that, it's reboot after reboot after reboot. And the reboot started to introduce more alien looking creatures. So uh, into the Legion, which which worked pretty great. But this version of Chameleon Boy is fantastic. Just the little things about Phantom Girl her paler skin and that kind of stuff that the little bit of an accent they give them as well works great. And the costumes look fantastic. And of course, Imra is a human because she's from a human colony that lives on Titan. If I remember correctly on, you know, one of the moons of Saturn and that particular human colony uh, had developed telepathic abilities. So, and she's a pretty powerful telepath, obviously. So in the Legion, each person has a set of powers, but typically those powers are not uncommon for their planet. So Phantom Girl, the reason why Phantom Girl can phase through objects is because her whole planet shifts between dimensions. So everyone on that planet has learned this ability. She's honed the ability to do it to to like hold on to somebody else and phase through objects with them. And she's also kind of honed the ability to do it not on the planet, they don't really get into too much of it, too much of other members of her species offside the, uh, off the planet. But like she's good at that. Or Cosmic Boy is another one who's got Magneto like magnetic powers. Well, that's pretty common on his planet. And he's like a professional mag ball player. So he's like a football player, basically. But he's just really, really good at manipulating these magnetic fields. And he, Cosmic Boy, Saturn Girl and Lightning Lad, who we haven't seen, Yet were the three like founding members uh, of the Legion, and then these other characters all came in later. Bam! And that's your Legion Crash Course from Rich Howard. Legion Crash Course Intro One Hundred and One. I got some Crash in the mode for that too, but not right now. So my first point with this episode was something that I noticed on my latest rewatch, as I was just looking for new things to talk about that we haven't talked about a million times, and. I really like at the start of this episode that we get this very brief glimpse of McGann as like 
the level-headed leader trying to calm everyone down and sort things out as quickly as possible. Like, she is the one who takes control in the opening scene of this episode. And I think it is just a really cool glimpse into, like, why she was team leader for a bit back in, in between seasons two and into season three. And I just think it's cool. It was something that stood out to me this time through being like, oh, look, that's cool. We like that. Yes. <laughs> Thank- <laughs> Thanks, Rich. I appreciate it. Appreciate the support. I, what else are you going to say? Like, she's just watching it's her good. character growth from yes. the very beginning of the first season, which I'll be rewatching um, soon. We had. <laughs> so how's that? I had. Uh, so I, I live in a new state now. We've met some new friends. And so one of my new friends came over to my house. Now we have a larger house now than we did before. So I actually have a full on library and on my walls, all my young justice stuff with the comics and everything. And he was like, whoa. My other friend was like, okay, Rich, 60 seconds or less. Get him. <laughs> What's Young Justice? <laughs> I was like, here's here's seven seconds. Go watch it. So he's like, I guess I should watch the show. And he's like, uh-huh. I'm like, uh-huh. Go watch that show. So we're going to be, I'm like, probably going to be rewatching from the beginning again. This is what uh, we do. <laughs> all that to say, it's going to be incredible, like, doing this season and then going back and doing a rewatch, which has been a little while for the first season to see all of the character growth, all of the character change, everything that's happened over through these four seasons is going to be amazing. So speaking of character growth, the conversation that we get in this episode between McGann and McCalm is so good. Like we've talked about this before, about this idea that like McGann's actual life on Mars has always kind of been glossed over in the narrative of like, she had a lot of sisters, but had a lonely childhood. Uh, she had to deal with some amorphous form of prejudice, et cetera. But this arc is kind of the first time that we really see the extent of what all of that meant for the first time in more concrete terms. And yeah. just McGann saying that she needed to run away from home because she literally felt like she was dying on Mars says so much to me about the depth of this character and the depth of this particular story. Like looking back, rewatching season one, uh, which I did a while back, like season one McGann is just a girl who is overjoyed by mundane things because she can breathe again for the first time in a very long time. And that is amazing and heartbreaking and lends even more depth to those early episodes of that character when it's just like, oh, she's just, fun and excited and girly and you're like yeah because she hasn't been for a very long time yeah or she's finding joy for the first time in her life yeah. <laughs> hmm. great suddenly very dark that's a dark cookie baking episode i'm telling you but, right there. <laughs> but also not in like the the idea of like yeah i love this idea of this character who is as i said it was overjoyed by something as mundane as like I can bake cookies. I can have friends. I can do the things that I'm interested in and is so excited about those things is beautiful and amazing. And I love it. Emily likes Miss Marshall. If I can yes and on that. Who would have guessed? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, I guess you kind of alluded to this, but this, this idea that it's almost like there's a part of her trying to look at everyone else and going like, don't you see what you've got here? Are you taking all this for granted? Like this is a, this, this is amazing things. All the little things are amazing things and you take them for granted every day because it's something that you do and see every day. Yeah. But everybody is like, why are you so excited about that thing? Like that thing's just a thing we have every day. And she's like, you should also be excited about this thing. You should be more full of joy about the opportunities that you have here. You know, she also learns from the team, the idea that they have all these things, but it, at the same time, if you think about them individually, all the things that they're also struggling with, once those things start to be revealed, you know, Superboy, obviously, you know, being <laughs> weeks old, having the memories of that, there's a lot going on. But then you think about, you know, Robin <laughs> dealing with, well, Dick losing his parents being the protege of Batman, which has its ups and its downs. Let's, uh, let's, <laughs> let's, let's be not, honest. Yeah. <laughs> or, or Artemis and all of the struggle of her own family. Right. And, you know, from the system of like, they want to be criminals and that's not the path that I want to walk. Um, so yeah, both the yes. And of realizing you guys don't see what you have. Oh, but I don't see the things. Now I see the things that you're going through. And then like you're saying, yeah. ending up with this, 
you know, season four version that is because on the rewatch, one of my first thoughts was like, wait, like the he might be dead. Why are we not doing more about that? Also, who do you guys not have firefighters? What a terrible job on Mars. Um, but like my first thought was just like, there she is. Just OK, you Connor, you go deal with the fire because obviously you should do that. OK, That's no, been Connor's this, job this, since this. day one. Oh, yeah. We the have- second you get here. If there's a fire, it's your it's your problem, sir. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's the it's the Martian equivalent of how you call your partner to kill the spider. Uh, yeah, there's a fire. <laughs> I've th- I've thought this through every time I rewatch this. I'm just like, how terrifying are fires inside? Fires inside. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, I agree. It's just it's the nuance of this character and seeing this character evolve. And I promise I will have things to say about characters who aren't Miss Martian when we get to arcs that aren't about Miss Martian. Uh, that but, aren't Miss Martian. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but like the scene with her and Macom and thinking about like, I have a joke note in here that says family therapy for all 31 people involved in this dynamic, yeah. which I am both. Serious and not serious about, because that's a lot of people. But also, please sit down. Also, give me the names of every single one of McGann's siblings. And also related to all that, like, throwback to McGann in season three, being able to understand and reason with Harper over how she was tolerating abuse to protect her younger brother, which we, I know, discussed Mm. as a possibility last season. And then, like, having this conversation, like, oh, very literally, uh, it, McGann is relating to that conversation with Harper. Yeah. And then just the perspective, the perspective drop of her saying to like, I was also a kid, like compared to you, you were looking at me as the quote unquote uh, adults, like anyone who's older than me knows better than me. Yeah. Right. Any anybody who's older than me should have known better than me. Right. And so I can blame and point fingers at the other people. But she was just a kid too and not everybody gets the same lessons not everybody learns the same things you know yeah because we contrast all of that scene with the two of them with the reveal that like emery was never told by her parents that they were married by a man who was so close Mm -hmm. to death that he didn't care what would happen to him anymore which one very metal and it and was probably the only person who would do it yeah Yeah, also very metal. One, very metal. (laughs) Two, the fact that, like, that is a story that McGann knew and her sister didn't. And, like, that way in which who was told that, or at least who listened to that, says so much. Like, I, because I don't think it's that Emery just never listened or never paid attention. Like, Emery's reaction tells me that, like, no one ever told Emery. Like, Emery just never knew that about her family. And, like, never knowing that about her family informs the way that she probably like as we see throughout this arc kind of like doesn't think it's that bad quote unquote because she doesn't have her whole family history and doesn't have the full perspective that even McGann has yeah. or that McCom has but has interpreted so differently is wild look i'm the youngest of four kids and i came quite a few years past my other three siblings who were born pretty close together i'm constantly like i didn't know that <laughs> nobody because they were like oh well when we were talking about it or when it was happening or whatever was going on my three older siblings were either that age and involved in it while i was so much younger and playing legos i don't know or or the story came up at various times and nobody thought like oh we should just let rich know now imagine if there's 28 other people yeah like there's 28 29 siblings somebody's some something's come something's falling through the cracks the key there is also when you think about it from the perspective of time, because I know, I mean, I will, I will not use the names to protect those involved, but I know of um, people where it was four siblings and the other two view their parent, the older two view their parents in a, a much more positive light because the second two were around when there was alcoholism and things along those nature. But if you look yeah. at the span of time that these 29 were born it's decades worth of time and how that's yeah. shifting. If you think when when does the king come in and decide that, oh, hey, maybe we are all we are all the same. Tensions are rising. Things are different. The other thing I think of is looking to someone that is older and being they clearly have it figured out. Welcome to the real world. <laughs> no, they don't. 
they super don't have it figured out. I mean, yeah. we could use we could use this the three of us on this podcast to all talk to each other about how I still don't have it figured out probably at all. But um, <laughs> so I think it. I think that while it is so, you know, there's the the low hanging fruit. While it is so alien to see these things <laughs> at the same time, like there are such real world touch points to their relationships yeah. across the board that it's like that's why it hits so hard. Yeah, and and so. McGann's like 45 in Earth years. Is that right? In the first season, she's in her 40s. It's brought up, yeah. but she's Earth and then wise it's been age, Earth like years. 16. Yeah. Right. How Martian so, age so you have this many have siblings. <laughs> we don't ask. We don't know. We don't Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. But like, I mean, so Emery was older. Yeah. How much older? Right. McGann was older than Makam. How much older? Yeah. Like if McCom was 10 when this is going on and McGon McGann was 30 when this was going on. Well, I mean, from our perspective, you're like, yeah, she's 20 years older. She's got a few more years of experience under her belt. We don't know what the age difference is there too. giving McCom some some credit for like, hey, you know, you should have known better. But also, McGann, like I was just a kid, you know, we're all doing our best. And we look back and we we all exist in different. There's a, so many different versions of rich. <laughs> Right. Oh, yeah, I remember that version of Rich, you know, that version of Rich to that age. And then I learned this stuff and then I and then I then I made these mistakes and then I learned this stuff. And then you're just different. You know, I'm both exactly the same and a completely different person than I was, you know, even a couple of years ago, much less 30. Right. And so, yeah, having this. I mean, how old are her parents? That many kids. They are parent age. They are hundreds. Of they years are whatever old. age it is to be a parent. <laughs> Yeah, she was 48 when she showed up in season one. And so here's another thing. Here's another thing that always just boggles my mind. Like Martians are both long lived and prolific. Like, I mean, are they peopling the entire center of the Mars? Like, I mean, that that's a lot of surface area. If you start digging under the it's like it's like living in the ocean, right? It's not just the surface area of the ocean like we live in on the surface of the earth. It's like all of the depth of it, too. So are they just like like an ant colony living uh, through the entire inside? There has got to be so many Martians. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? That's acknowledged in the first episode of the season of like Garfield hasn't been back to Mars since the trip at the end of season two. Right. I think that's what they say. I think that's what's implied. Yeah. Of like that's the yeah. last time Garfield's been to Mars. And like he's like, oh, everything's bigger like and it's been what like three years years? three four years and he's like ah yeah the city has expanded exponentially in the past three four years i wonder why like oh yeah (laughs) there's so many marches yeah and this thing with this thing with the with the bomb the gene bomb because like in the i don't don't think this is crashing the mode but like this gene bomb shows up and i was like oh no (laughs) oh because in the comics, if I remember correctly, the most recent version of Makam is that Ma'ala Fa'ak is the respons- is, is the one responsible for the complete genocidal wipeout of all the Martians. And so this gene bomb shows up and I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. You just had intense ex- anxiety immediately. <laughs> yeah. You had I'm the like, anxiety oh. of a man who has read years of comic book history. Oh, oh no. Well, the flip side the flip side of that is that it's Dasad bringing it. So, question 1, is it actually going to kill only those or is it just going to kill all of them because you have this interconnectedness between Earth and Mars? Let's not get it twisted. Eventually the fight hap- you know, the theoretical fight that we talk about for all, you know, all of these seasons is what is the play? Well, I guess it's crashing the mode. I should shut up. I'll talk about it later. <laughs> What I was going to say about the gene bomb, my note about this is just the acknowledgement that McComb really and truly does not care whether he lives or dies in his planned attack is, again, just it's wild. It is such an intense character decision about explaining who this character is to us that is said so quickly and move past so quickly, but again, tells you so much about this character and you're like, Oh, that's the level of this that we're dealing with. Understood. Because it's not a surprise what shows up. That means that that bomb was either suggested or requested. Yep. Yeah. He's not baffled by its existence. He's like, well, yeah, there you go. Thanks for 
Thanks for cashing my check. Yep. Yeah. And I think this might be what you were touching on, Neil, which I don't think is crashing the mode, but like Martians are just a whole bunch of Kryptonians with more powers. Like, but a more who common are prolific weakness. And long- <laughs> yeah, more common weakness. So that compensates for the fact that they could, that they're, <laughs> what's the what's the phrase we use for? <laughs> oh, ball of sunshine, terrifying demigod. <laughs> yeah, ter- but they're all ter- terrifying demigods. It's just all terrifying demigods. So like, Desaad laughs way too much for the amount of time that he has in this in this scene. He's all, <laughs> yes, <laughs> blow them all up. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh my god stop laughing dude you're freaking me out well i mean even if you look at you know in the previous episode you have a thousand you know a thousand people that have collectively united their mind and the power that they had and that's really just them thinking something that's not actively trying to accomplish some psychic attack and now imagine you have oh, gosh, a yes. planet of Yikes. them millions of them with a collective goal of anything Anything right. at all, and then what that's going to mean. <laughs> Here's a picture of Dark Side. Everybody, yeah, just, just go. think about it. <laughs> <laughs> just think about, just think about his brain. Done. Oh no! The only thing holding terrible. Mars back is a lack of organization. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, the sides. I, the whole scene the side. He's just like, I love it when a plan comes together. He's just like, yes, please blow this planet up. We don't have to do anything. Also. You did something for us, and then you're now also doing something for yep. us. Excellent. Yep. Uh, we win, right? <laughs> it's like so messed up, man. Don't make a deal with the sod. Don't do it. Uh, anyway, where were we? Detective Chimp. <laughs> Detective Chimp. Yes. I gotta love a Detective Chimp reference. Yep. Well, and of course, the just to jump into the super, those super random ones I have, of course, going clear back to uh, issue number two of the tie-in comics. Hey, everyone, read the tie-in comics. <laughs> the Connor's aversion to monkeys and going all the way back to that. And of course, oh, yeah. ju- casually dropping nice. Detective Chimp, which I feel like... It opens up I know it's so just many comics questions. And, yeah, it's comics in general, because I don't think it's ever stated here, but like the theory is like Detective Chimp is the number two smartest detective in the DC universe. Second, elongated oh. man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Elongated man, I believe, is number two, Miss. Oh, sorry. That's <laughs> a tough fight be- between those. I bet they would I bet they'd have to fight it out yep. with their brains. I'm not quite sure. Anyway, like just yeah. just kidding. It could be either one of them. And he and he names elongated man in that yep. list. Too. Yeah. <laughs> that was so good. It was so good. Everybody's like, <laughs> I just picture all the people who don't know DC comics like elongated man he's so excited about some guy named elongated man why is he that excited the other one i have is that thank you to the power of ask greg uh someone really wanted to know what perdita said at the start and end of her message and it is hello and i love you of course it is i kind of guessed it was probably i love you but also it's nice to have the confirmation it does i can guess that that was i love you but it's nice to know for sure Speaking of which, I have uh, one of my other notes here is simply my adorable alien OTP is getting married and making me cry. (laughs) And it's just, I just, I love, again, everything in this arc is just Emily cries over Martian wedding traditions. There are steps. There is a literal magical ceremony on a magic river. It's called a Ma'ayava Ana, and I will know how to say that (laughs) for reasons unknown to myself or others. And particularly giving a shout out to the random little shot of McGann flying, dancing around Connor and me just for whatever reason being like, that's the most precious thing I've seen all day. I'll just go cry about it. Middle school Emily is very happy over all of this. And adult Emily is also happy, (laughs) just with more nuance and analysis attached to it. I'll say Ma'ayava Ana one more time, just just to get it out there. Just for Neil's sake. Just to get in there. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, nope. <laughs> nope. Nope. War world. That's Wait, what I got. Neil, Neil, please try to say it. Try okay, to say it so, one time. Ma, uh, no, ma, no, ma, no, no. I'm going to try and read it. I can't do it. I can't think of it. Certainly not. Let's see. Ma, uh, where is it? I knew it was right here. I like that it's also not underlined in the outline. It's just like, that's a word. The I'm like, outline oh, is not. accepted. The way that my phone now autocorrects <laughs> McGann right. to have an apostrophe <laughs> in it. My. 
<laughs> yeah, I literally can't find it now. It's right here. It should be in this spare. Oh, I got Cobra with a K is underlined, but my Yavana is not. <laughs> my Aya Ava. I uh, know. Uh, my... You're fine. I'm adding too you much. Can, you can. You can. Move okay, on. I'm going to tell you what I tell my kids, Neil. There's not six other letters in this word. Just read the letters that are there. You don't need an extra T or an N. I'm going to go reheat my food in the microwave. Microwave. Rich says of a word that has five A's in it. Yes. Don't put any extra A's. No extra A. Don't put an extra A. Don't put a Z. Speaking of, yeah, speaking of Cobra, we're going to see uh, a glimpse into the Outsiders, which I think is yeah. super cool. Yes. I love Cobra's face in that picture. Wow. He is one of the least used yet most interesting characters. I, that's all I have about because it's like he seems like he's just been around forever, but also just real frustrated about things in general. He I'm just a, keeps getting he just keeps getting beat up by teenagers. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a Every god. Pops up multiple times in the show. Pops up in the tie-in comics, and I don't think ever succeeds at oh, anything. Yeah, that's right. Uh, he's he in the turns tie-in himself com- into a snake in the tie-in comics, into a giant oh, snake, right. and still gets that's beat right. up by three teenagers, only one of whom has powers. Read the tie-in comics. Yes, read tie-in comics, friends. And listen to comic commentary as we talk about that. Or go listen. We had, we interviewed Christopher Jones, too. That was fantastic. Go listen to that one. Read that tie-in comic. Learn why the uh, Robin Artemis Kid Flash ship is called Museum Heist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, that's true. What else you got, Neil? Uh, that's it. These are the this arc has a surprising lack of things to connect. Now, I mean, that said, like with the Martians, most of the Martians that are presented have been presented through comics history. A lot of it doesn't tie directly to the story that's being told because, like, as previously mentioned, a lot of the stories are that Martian Manhunter is the last, um, and things like that. And so, Jim originally, and I believe even the Red Martians are Saturnian. Yes. Which I guess that doesn't make the Martians. It makes them from Saturn. But uh, the so there's yes. a lot of there's a lot of touch points um, throughout comics history because we can't we we got to re got to reuse those names. I don't think the Yalone exist, right? Those are were those new. I don't remember the Yalone, but I mean, the Reds were also yeah. super vague. They they came up in a random piece of uh, research I was doing from the first two seasons. I was like, there were Red Martians. And then I realized they were from something else. So are you looking it up now, Neil? I don't think the I don't think the alone were a thing. I think that's new. No, they do eventually show up, but it was it was only appeared in the pre pre crisis Earth One. So like they are. I oh mean, gosh, the eight early eighties or oh okay, <laughs> okay. Well, you know things fall through the cracks, people. In, in one issue of Wonder Woman, so okay, there you go. Fantastic. I don't feel from nineteen fifty nine. Oh, whoa. that is definitely pre-crisis. That is some wow. serious. I was pre- not prepared. I was not that's prepared. That's pre, 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 pre-crisis. Man, Greg and Brandon, they're like, no, that had, that existed. Really? When? 1956, one issue, Wonder Woman. What? Bring me every Martian. <laughs> yeah. When we say read the tie-in <laughs> comics, this is not what we mean. <laughs> that's how I know. Yes. <laughs> Uh, oh my gosh yikes comics are very straightforward and have never once been confusing that's never once had been rebooted absolutely it all makes sense that was what i was also telling my friends too. the the new friend who i was like man if you don't know dc and you want to know about dc or new or get touchstones of so many things in dc comics history young justice is your source all right, so many people use like so the Marvel Cinematic Universe. They didn't know anything about the Marvel Universe. Now everybody knows who Iron Man is, who was a total like C rate hero back in the day before the movie came out. Now everybody knows who he is. It's so strange to me. But like now everybody knows that. Everybody knows who the X Men were. Back when I was a kid, nobody knew the X Men. DC, it, you know, people watch the movies and they kind of get these characters from the live action DC. They just don't cover all the characters. You know, and there's so many characters and so many things and yellow Martians from 1956. Like, you're going to get you're going to get all kinds of stuff. I mean, we got Dr. Fate in a live action movie. Are we going to get Zatara? 
was so good. I don't know. I don't think so. Probably not. Yeah, he that was actually really entertaining, Doctor Fate. I have to say. Well, are we good? Are we good? Are we wrapped with Aster? I think mm-hmm. so. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that. We're all feeling the mode. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in season four, but in Crashing the Mode, we will be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on wild flights of fancy. So Garfield continues to have a time. Remember how season three's Crashing the Mode was Halo is a mother box? Season four's Crashing the Mode is Garfield is having a time. <laughs> yeah. I, yep. I forgot about Halo is a mother box. Oh, yeah. Just a mother box. <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. This is totally Garfield. Garfield's wrecked. Yep. Garfield's Garfield wrecked. continues to be Episode wrecked. three, Garfield's wrecked. Episode 10, Garfield's wrecked. We'll have more context for that next episode, but season episode two just continues to be the low level Garfield continues to have a time. Although I, I do want to note one piece and I didn't want to note it before, <laughs> but I do want to note one piece that I think, cause I think it was hard to, I think it was a little bit harder for that storyline to be watched over the different arcs over the span of the, the season. I think it works a lot better when you can just kind of binge through. But I think one of the important things to note is that there's clearly something going on. It's being acknowledged by Connor and it's it seems that it's being somewhat acknowledged, but obviously not further in. And then he turns into the Martian dolphin and McGann's like, ah, see, he just needed a distraction. And I'm like, I don't think that's what he needed. And we will prove that soon enough. Yes. Um, but I think it, it re- really speaks to the idea of like the way a lot of us can look at those things of like seeing those moments of positivity or happiness and some and kind of glossing over some of some of the darker things that these boys clearly go, going through. Yeah. And, you know, and, you know, in the next episode, she even talks about, like, I feel like crap that I didn't understand what was happening. And she's a therapist. Yeah. Like, that's kind of what she does, much less being telepathic and and all of these other things, you know, like she and all. But there's a part of her who's just like, you know, what? <laughs> I just want to be married. Can I just do that, please? <laughs> but also even just in rewatch in rewatching these episodes, noticing and paying attention to how many times it comes up and somebody tries to address it and other things just start happening. We're going to get to it in episode three. Like there's a moment where Connor tries to be like, what are you talking about? You zoned out completely, blah, blah. And they, the conversation gets immediately interrupted and Garfield just switches lanes. And like that keeps yeah. happening. Like even in this episode, like every time that they try to be like, Hey, what's up? Like dolphins happen. Like yeah. things just keep happening. It's interesting rewatching it, knowing where this is headed and being like, it's not that nobody tries and it's not that Garfield is, it's just that thing life keeps happening and that is both inevitable and part of the problem. And I, and I th- think that's something too, with like just human nature or half Kryptonian nature. Sorry, <laughs> Connor. But this idea that you you know, he's asking and in the next episode he asks, but like, you also kind of want to take your friend at their word and, and feel like they trust you or like love you and will tell you if they need help. But you also want to ask because same things seem off and you know, you, it's like, how far do you push into somebody else's business and how, you know, when do you draw that line and you know, that kind of stuff. And just, he asks a lot, like checks in a lot. Aside from the overarching crashing the mode of Garfield is having a time, my other notes here are Phantom Girl at one point in this episode fe- says phasing another person takes a lot out of me, which is just set up for explaining why yeah. taking Connor all the way to the Phantom Zone would put her in a coma, uh, which we will see later. Which is nice. good good to set these things up. We we sprinkle We sprinkle the seeds so that we can see them grow into plot points later. Well, yeah, and I, I wrote that and like just really trying to establish their power yeah. because we have because they are they are literally in the background of this story because they that, you know, they feel that they need to be there, you know, timelines and all that. But the idea of like, oh, what a person can or can't do Saturn girl being like, oh, hey, you kind of saw me ah, and then we ran away. <laughs> but like, OK, establishing that while as strong as she may be psychically, 
there are limitations to that, especially when you have a uh, demigod on your hands. Um, and trying to yeah, understand. which the, I mean, you had mentioned it earlier, but I, for me, that also speaks to how powerful she is to be that close and to be able to hide from McGon at all. Yeah, and hide uh, Cam oh, other and people. Phantom yeah. Girl as well. Yeah, absolutely. Just a just a quick compliment to I mean, this is this is what Young Justice does, right? Like it it puts it it puts little things in to establish before it gets to the next thing three episodes later or six episodes later or whenever I can't remember how many episodes is when we find Phantom Girls unconscious. Right. But like say something, right? Like it, it would have made sense if they hadn't have said anything, but they go out of their way to make sure like we just, Hey, let's establish this little piece of this little piece of, of what, how physics, how weird superhero physics works <laughs> in episode in this episode. So that in 10 episodes later, you know, there's consistency. In that same scene, we also get the our our first glimpse at Connor can be hurt during this arc that is set up so quickly. And also, I made a note of like rewatching that that scene, seeing how Garfield and McGann react is so well written and so well acted for both of them being deeply shocked like because connor seemingly knew that this was a possibility didn't tell anyone and just the idea of seeing someone that you love and care about be hurt for the first time seemingly and you've known this person for 10 years you have seen them fall into lava and be fine yes him getting a cut on his forehead would actually freak you out that deeply yeah but as we joked uh i'm sure this will never come up again of course it comes up it is a driving right. force for later in this arc <laughs> And it's just as good. Just we have this that little setup here of just, hey, time to be worried about Connor. Well, and, and you know, if we're talking about hashtag Garfield's wrecked, like he, he he's yeah. like, oh, Superboy will be fine. He's invulnerable. I'll never have to worry about him dying. It's everybody else. <laughs> yeah. Oops. Oops. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. And he's just like, I, it's okay, guys. Like, I'm, I'm all right. I'm yeah, come on. We move farther from the sun. I'm under the ground. There's less oxygen. It makes perfect sense. I don't know what the problem is here. I did Why the, are you freaking out? I'm I did the superhero out. math. I did the superhero math. <laughs> or like Connor had a conversation with, with like Clark about this or something. It was like, oh, okay, cool. Keep it in mind. And moved on because Connor is just <laughs> that chill about this. Yeah, you would think Clark would be like, hey, by the way, things to worry about. Sparkles and the power of friendship magic. Gotta look out for that. That'll kill you. <laughs> also, no sun. Yeah, perhaps like, you know, breathing eventually is probably something you're going to want to do. You know, check those check those things out. Yeah. Also, weird, impy dudes from the fifth dimension or whatever, wherever Pixel Plix from. Wait, this is also where we established that the javelin is very very fast oh yeah very fast somebody says who was it steel he's like oh it's gonna we're on the other side of the galaxy it'll take us a couple days or something <laughs> it's like even at like pre-light speed or something something along those lines which yeah i can't tell like there's enough and i'm doing this for crash in the mode because there's enough things that are really interesting of like What's perfect timing? What's just coincidence of like, oh, well, we should have the wedding today. Oh, well, we can't do that. We got some stuff to build. Oh, we could have the wedding tomorrow. Well, no, hold on. I've got a meeting tomorrow. I can't be doing that. And then this. Also to couple it with then the gene bomb's going to be here at this specific time. And so it's like all just trying to process like serendipity or... I mean, you have people from the future, so they know a lot. But then also to say, okay, the javelin is across the Milky Way, so we got to get a couple extra days here. Then they can show up. I'm just like, ah. So. What? Best 50,000 light years? <laughs> and what did they say? A week? It's going to take us a week to get back? I can't a remember the days. exact. A couple days. Because this arc is only like a four days. days. Yeah, wow. And I, I guess... I mean, compared to like, I guess the Green Lanterns pretty much get from Earth to Oa in like a like a wormhole heartbeat. So I guess that's the javelins, the slowest thing around. Yeah, I don't and, know. And, bo and boom tubes would be and boom tubes. Like, who needs anything with a boom and, tube and Zeta? And yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. What are we talking yeah. about? Yeah, yeah. It's like a tricycle, really. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs>
Also, what's Steel doing out there? What are they doing Stuff. out there? I want to know what I want to know what Steel is doing out They're there. They're having a separate adventure. They're having a spin-off from the spin-off. From the spin-off from the spin-off spin-off. Yeah. There's going to be a comic. I, I want a comic of what Steel was doing on the other side of the galaxy. So uh, my last crash in the mode note here is about how Perdita's voicemail that we get at the end of this episode, that does break my heart, um, but also sets up not only stuff for later in this season with Brion and Markovia and that stuff that we will get in a later episode, but also sets up a great deal of the major conflict that we see happen in the Young Justice Targets comic miniseries that was released post season four. Read the tie in comics and we promise we'll get to those eventually. We got a at some we, point. In we got a lot of Young Justice content to get through. But yeah, if you want to see more payoff for uh, Markovia having problems and Queen Perdita trying to deal, read the comics. I have a question. It's it seems to be implying in that scene that that Gar is listening to the voicemail while he's flipping through the pictures. Is that how you guys read that scene? Correct. Yeah. Or that he had already listened to the voicemail and was just being sad afterward. Right. Well, but that's my point. That's two different reads. Like he's heard the voicemail and he's missing them and he's looking through the through the pictures is one Fair thing. Enough. He's absent mindedly like, hey, I got to get through my voicemails. Oh, oh, oh here's this emotional voicemail that. from my girlfriend. But I'm just I'm just going to I guess I'll just listen to that, not have any emotional reaction and flip through my pictures from Earth oh. is a completely different read. Like he's like emotionally broken yeah. inside that's not how i took it but i definitely can see that reading of it yeah oh, well i'm gonna add a third read. okay um superhero science could he even get yeah. it I've wouldn't he have gotten it before before he left what if he's also just flipping through the pictures and listening to it again he already knows exactly what's in oh that that's possible that and listening to it again while he goes through the pictures that that's because we know they are already in a weird place i got you in their relationship when when uh Gar yeah is going it's two Mars. different reads or at least are in a weird place in their relationship from garfield's perspective because as we see later in the season like queen perdita goes and tries to find him and thinks everything is kind of fine with them and he's the one who's like nah i've kind of shut down from having human interaction <laughs> yeah i don't human anymore right now and if you're going to talk about voicemails getting from earth to mars dude all i got to say to you is javelin fifty thousand light years my friend <laughs> They got super like, phones. I think that voicemail got there. His phone is transparent. <laughs> they got uh, super phones. It's... I really thought you were gonna. I thought I thought he was gonna say uh, th- I, you were gonna go the total opposite direction that it wouldn't work because I tried to send you that picture and it wouldn't come through. Oh, there's a big difference between Young Justice Universe and me in the middle of nowhere. Yes, uh, last time we recorded, everyone, I took my audio file, uh, tried to upload it, and uh, I'm pretty sure. I could have stuck it in an envelope with a stamp and it would have gotten to the old just as fast. We did, est- <laughs> we did establish that it would be faster to drive it on a USB and hand it to you. We did establish that. <laughs> yeah, there are parts of the United States, for those people who do not know, uh, that do feel a little third worldish in some ways on the electronics front anyway. Rich has bad Wi-Fi. <laughs> but to get back to crash in the mode, I think Neil, you had one more crash in the mode. Well, the well, though, so the last one is that it's really interesting to me how aware the man in the bubble, aka Lord Zod, is of the going ons of the Legionnaires. That dynamic, rewatching that dynamic, has been really interesting to me. the The concept that, like, you know, that cave in is associated directly with him trying to mess them up so that they don't mess him up. I, d- I don't feel like I took that away as much with the first watch of, of it was more of them trying to wait mm. for their exact moment to do whatever they needed to do while Lorzad is so seemingly unaware of their presence. But obviously that, you know, obviously that's not true, but it's just kind of surprising to me. I mean, he's got a lot to do. Don't get me wrong. He's blowing yeah. a lot of things up. Yeah, he's blowing, yeah. He's blowing a lot of things. It's up. his major way of doing things. Yeah. It, so. It's just interesting that dynamic and like having that go back and forth. Yeah. Agreed. 
All right. Well, let's wrap this up. We got we got a lot more of this season to go. And with all that, I think we can Zeta out of the Watchtower. Thank you for spending some time with us here today. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on our website, crashingthemode.com, and you can even email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And if you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S., as we have to look a little bit harder to find those. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And remember, stay well, stay everyone. Well, everyone. Yeah, you're gonna... You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Stay whelmed.